On today's show, horticultural intern Sarah Wallace identifies a persistent weed in our garden. Consumer horticulture specialist David Hillock prunes water sprouts and suckers. Former host Ray Campbell removes unwanted plants from ground covers. And we have gardening tips for August. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Nursery, Tulsa's source for great gardens, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We found an interesting new plant here in the vegetable garden, and I just wanted to let you know some information about it. This little grass, which is actually a nut sedge in the nut sedge family, is called Kylinga. K-Y-L-L-I-N-G-A. It is an invasive species originally from Asia that is now showing up across the southeastern United States. And the problem with these little Kylinga is that they grow and form a very large mat. And they make little nut sedge seed heads, which can make 5,000 seeds per year. And they grow, since they're perennial, they grow all summer and from spring to fall also. So they grow all year round and stay dormant in the winter time. So they are quite aggressive. And if you rototill them, you've dug up their hair-like roots and spread them out, and you've also dispersed the seeds. If you hoe them, you've also disturbed the roots and encouraged more root hairs to grow. And so the main uh, control mechanism with these is chemical. And so you really need to mix a sedge hammer, which is for nut sedges, and Roundup, which is glyphosate. And that is the real control we need to do for these Kylinga which are showing up in turf grasses and also here in our vegetable garden at Oklahoma State. Good afternoon, I'm Eloise Triplett, an ambassador at the Botanic Gardens, and it's a wonderful adventure to be an ambassador here. I'm here to give you the tips for August today. The general tips for August are Water all plants thoroughly unless rainfall has been adequate. It's better to water early in the morning, more in depth, and less often. Water compost during extremely dry periods so that it remains active. Turn the pile to generate heat for proper sterilization. Watch for high populations of worms, aphids, spider mites, thrips, scales, and other insects and treat as needed. Today we want to talk about managing water sprouts and suckers which can occur on some species. Now this is a good example of what we call suckers. Suckers are vigorous shoots that grow from the base of the tree, usually from the roots themselves or from the very lower portion or base of the trunk. And uh, these vigorous shoots um, are common on some species but can occur on, on just about any tree that's especially ones that may be under stress. So if you're seeing a lot of suckering coming off of, of, of your tree, then there's a good chance that you may be, uh, the tree may be stressed. And that can be a result of lots of things. Uh, there could be some root damage that has occurred. It could have been over pruning or heavy pruning at the wrong time. That will also result in suckering and, and water sprouts. Um, there, are some, like I mentioned, some species that this is just kind of natural for them to, to, to show up, uh, especially on fruit trees like apples and pears, um, as well as some of our ornamental trees such as the flowering plum, um, some of our elm trees and some of our maples will often produce suckers. Uh, the best way to really to manage these is to just prune them off. And, and uh, so we, you know, for something like this uh, that's coming down from the base of the tree, we're just gonna take a pair of pruners hand pruners and we're just going to clip it off at the base 
Um, there's a few that are growing up the side of the trunk here, and we'll just, we can, sometimes if they're small enough, we can just break them off too. Uh, we don't want to tear the bark up, but if you can just break it out, snap it off, then that's good. This one has, has been, <clears throat> you can see one here that has been formed a sucker before, and now it has uh, re, re sprouted. Um, we're going to take that one all the way back to the base. Now, in just doing hand pruning like this, uh, it's going to be something that you'll probably have to do on a regular basis or on a yearly basis because of the natural uh, tendency of the tree to, to form suckers. However, there, it, there are some products on, available to help control that chemically. Uh, they are synthetic hormones that are produced. And then NAA is usually the active ingredient in, in most of those products. And you need to make sure you read the label because the, how you apply that uh, will vary between different types of trees. So for example, apple trees, uh, you definitely want to do it during the dormant season or typically want to do it during the dormant season. So the way you would do that is you would go ahead and prune off your, your suckers and then you would spray. It usually comes in a ready to use uh, spray application. You would spray those spots um, and that will help control suckering later on down the road. Um, for ornamental trees, they recommend pruning off the, the, uh, the suckers and this can be done um, usually again in the dormant season, uh, but also it can be done uh, any time. And then as those shoots begin to re-sprout, that's when you would apply it. So we wanna actually wait until the, the new sprouts start coming out and then you would spray it and that would help control the suckering from uh, throughout the rest of the growing season. Water sprouts are those vigorous shoots that grow straight up from the, from the lateral branches vertically into the tree. And uh, these are, uh, you know, not really desirable. Uh, both the suckers and the water sprouts can sap energy from the tree, so we typically will want to remove them. Um, they will occur, the water sprouts typically occur around pruning cuts, and again, maybe if the tree is under stress. So if the tree is really under stress and you've got some water sprouts, you may choose to leave some of them just so that it can provide energy for the tree to continue to grow. But otherwise, we'll probably want to remove them. Uh, again, because they're going straight up into the canopy of the tree, they don't look really uh, natural. They kind of make the, the canopy look messy. They'll eventually be crossing and rubbing, rubbing against other branches. And again, they can take away some of that vigor. So again, the best way to probably control those is just get in there and prune them. Uh, you can prune them out uh, just about any time of the year, though. Again, probably the dormant season would be the best time. Now here is an example of a tree that you can tell is under stress. We have suckers going all the way up the trunk and, and into the canopy of the tree. And if you look high in the canopy, you'll see that a lot of the branches have died back, the major branches. So this tree was under stress. This is very likely due to the recent droughts that we've had. So there's been some root damage and the tree is sending out all these suckers in an effort to keep itself alive. The suckers growing along the trunk are probably never gonna be as strongly attached to the trunk as the original scaffold branches were. And so that needs to be taken into consideration. They may be weakly attached. Um, they're not growing in a good, good angle. Um, so you may want to leave them on for a little while, but eventually you're going to want to remove these and thin them out. But really what this requires is a really good evaluation of the tree. Um, trees are great at a value to our landscapes, but something like this, do you really want to mess with it? Um, it's going to be probably a weaker tree um, and may even start developing some rot and some issues later on down the road. And now it can become a hazard tree. And so you have to take into consideration what um, the life of this tree is going to be like, uh, if it could become a liability later on, and have it assessed and decide whether or not you really ought to take it down or just have it replaced. And you can, uh, if you need help doing that, you can contact a certified arborist. Uh, they have the ability to come in and help you evaluate that and uh, decide on whether or not you need to leave it or take it down. Our August tips for trees and shrubs. Need pruning to hedges and shrubs about mid-August. Discontinue deadheading roses by mid-August to help initiate winter hardiness. Watch for second generation of fall webworm in late August or early September. Remove the webs that enclose branches and destroy. Or use an appropriate insecticide spray with very good penetration. 
Young trees and shrubs may be fertilized again. August tips for flowers. Towards the end of the month, divide and replant spring blooming perennials like iris, peonies, and daylilies if needed. August tips for vegetables. August is a good month to start your fall vegetable garden. Bush beans, cucumbers, and summer squash can be replanted for another crop. Beets, broccoli, carrots, potatoes, lettuce, and other cool season crops can also be planted at this time. August tips for fruits and nuts. Continue protective insecticide applications on the fruit orchard. Don't abandon the program too early. Check directions for last application prior to harvest. Very frequently I'm asked to recommend a ground cover for, for someone to use in their landscape that can be put in an area that for some reason is a, is a problem or a hard to care for area. It may be an area like under a large shade tree such as we have here where because of the shade and because of the competition of the roots of this very large tree, grass will not grow and we want something that will cover that. Or it may be in an area that's simply hard to mow. Uh, uh, an area where it just, for some other reason it just may be difficult to maintain and so a ground cover uh, could be the ideal solution for that. However, we need to know that ground covers are not maintenance free and we do have to continue to work on them but we want as little maintenance as possible. So we're really not here today to talk about ground covers. Really I'm here today to talk about and give you some tips on how to control some of those undesirable plants that are going to come up in ground covers so that you can deal with them before they get to be a major problem. Here we have English Ivy which is a very good ground cover. It's, uh, it's very uh, rapid growing, it's uh, a very inexpensive, it's accessible at most all garden centers and, and uh, stores that sell plants of, of any type, uh, where it's the big box store or just the local nursery and garden center, and so it is a good choice for you. However, I've got this particular ground cover here close to the entrance of my house, where my mailbox is, where my driveway is, and I come by here every day. And so I can maybe two or three times a day. And so if I see something that needs to be tended in this ground cover, I can easily care for it because it's, it's there and, and in front of me at all time. And the major problem I have with this ground cover and you will have with any ground cover such as this are those undesirable plants like little tree seedlings and weeds and things like that that come up uh, in, in that need to be cared for and tended to. And so in this particular area, because I see it every day, I have, uh, a good opportunity to take care of those. Now this is an oak tree, a big Schumard oak. I've got other oak trees in the area. I've got walnut and pecan trees in the neighborhood. So I have a kajillion little oak and walnut and pecan seedlings that come up. And if I did not take care of those very quickly, I would really have a forest here. But every time I can see a, a little tree of some type come up, like this little either oak or a walnut tree, if it's small and, it's, and, and I catch it in time, I can just gently reach down and pull it out of the ground and get rid of it that way and throw it to the side and I don't have to deal with it. And also with these vining and creeping ground covers we have to be sure to be on the lookout for another plant that looks very very similar to it that can really become aggressive and in that case it's the Virginia creeper. The Virginia creeper looks a lot like the ivy and again you can get it while it's small but being sure that you take care of, 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 of the entire vine at the same time and if, again, if you get those while they're small, you can just simply pull those out by the roots and there you've got this cleaned up again very easily. With this plant, though, if you don't do it because of its aggressiveness, it will completely take over and really mingle in and really ruin the looks of your pure stand of your English ivy. But in the back, where I don't go very often, I've got another ground cover where some real problems can occur. And there's another solution that I wanted to t uh, point out to you that you can use to control those undesirable plants in that ground cover if they get ahead of you. In this area, which is in uh, an area in my backyard where I don't frequent nearly as often, and also because there's some ground cover here that's very, very aggressive, I really don't get out here and tend to this ground cover like I did the English ivy. 
This actually is Vinca Major, actually a really nice ground cover, very aggressive, very fast growing, but it crept over from my neighbors and I've just decided just to leave it and let it be uh, the ground cover in this particular shrub bed. But back here I have a lot of, of weed trees and undesirable trees that where seeds have been dropped by the birds that tend to come up. And here we've got an old mulberry tree, for example, that I certainly don't want uh, in my ground cover. So the way that I take care of this is when I see them is I go down as close to the ground as possible and just clip those off then I've got Roundup, which is pure undiluted Roundup in a little container. I have it marked so I'll know what it is. That I've taken a jar, drilled a hole in the top of the, of the lid, and put a paintbrush down in there. A little sponge paintbrush, secured it with some putty, and I can just come in and paint those little stumps or those little twig areas that I've cut off with the Roundup, and that keeps it from regrowing. That actually is a recommendation on the Roundup container label. So it is approved for doing this. You can also, of course, just do a spray of Roundup, a regular spray of Roundup, but I don't want to, uh, to dilute a whole sprayer just to, to control a few little uh, shrubs or a few little weed trees in my ground covers. On down here, we have one that is really difficult to control, and this is a privet. Uh, oftentimes we may have the tendency when we see a plant coming up like this, like a privet or a mulberry or an elm or whatever it is coming up in our ground covers or in our shrub beds or even in our flower beds, to just go in and clip, clip those off and not do anything. And when we do that, we see that they'll come back and they'll be malted trunks such as this and they'll grow even more quickly and more aggressively. So on this one, I'm going to have to go in now and do that again where it's all been cut off. This probably would be better if I had my loppers rather than this. I could go down even next to the ground itself and get it off. The lower you go, the better. But since I don't have my loppers with me, I'll just give it a good trimming and a good haircut. Come in again and just paint all of that very, very good with my Roundup and keep that from sprouting back out that way. So what I like to do is just occasionally check my ground covers, check my shrub beds, check my perennial beds. And as I see these weed trees or these problem plants begin to develop, the quicker you get a hold of them, the better it is. There we'll have a nice pure stand of your ground cover and plants that you want in there and not the plants that the birds want to plant in there for you. Now another really undesirable plant that you may find in the landscape, particularly if you're in a wooded area or if you're close to a, a place that is wooded, then you're going to more than likely this year run into some poison ivy. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about now. And notice I'm putting on a long sleeve shirt because when you deal with poison ivy, you want to have as much protection as possible because just a touch of that, if you're allergic to it, will can cause you some real problems. Fortunately, I have never been allergic to poison ivy, but I really respect the plant. My doctor told me one time that just because I do not have an allergy to it now, it doesn't mean that the next time it touches me, I could, and it would really blow up on me. And so I want to be really sure that I protect myself from this. Now the poison ivy is a plant that is often confused with other plants, or I should say other plants many times are confused with the poison ivy, particularly Virginia creeper, which we'll show you in just a few minutes, and also Boston ivy, because in the seedling stage and the juvenile growth, they look very much the same. But the poison ivy can easily be identified by just the little saying, if you remember it, leaves of three, leave me be. And you can see how the poison ivy comes out in a sort of an elongated uh, shape like this with the serrations on the leaves. It's a serrated leaf and uh, the leaves of three that's very, very typical and very common in the poison ivy to see it that way. So anytime you see a plant like this that has that particular shape, then you pretty well assure that it is poison ivy. And I would be very, very careful about the poison ivy and the way you handle it is, and I said really respect it because it is a plant that can cause you a lot of problems. Uh, in the landscape and because we've had so much rain this year I think we're going to have more of these undesirable plants coming up than we've ever had before. We're going to treat this poison ivy just like I did uh, the other uh, weed trees that I was trying to get rid of. I'm going to clip it off, 
close to the ground. Notice it's coming out into another area over there. Clip all of it off, even back in the back. And also paint it with my Roundup. Now with poison ivy, you can just use a, a Roundup spray or you can get the poison ivy uh, killers uh, and sprays and spray those as well. <clears throat> but I, as I've said on the other, I really don't want to, to come in and uh, fix up an entire tank of spray just to control this poison ivy. So I'm just gonna paint it where I clipped it off. And I'm gonna go on up and paint some toward the back. Actually, I clipped some of this off after I sprayed it the other day, but I'm gonna paint it again. Come down and give this one another really good dose here on the end. And then come over and spray this one where I, where I cut it off as well. Now, one more thing about the poison ivy. Remember that this poison ivy, just because you've clipped it off means, it does not mean that it doesn't cause you some real problems. So if with this one, I'm going to very carefully fold it up, put it in a plastic bag. I can get my plastic bag unfolded. Hopefully not touching my skin. Then I will tie this bag up. Oop. And then this is gonna go into the trash. You can't even burn poison ivy. The smoke from the poison ivy will, uh, will get into your lungs and really cause some problems or get in, into, into, your, into your nostrils and your air passages. Be sure when you're checking your firewood or you're getting firewood that you don't have firewood that brings in poison ivy with it. It's really a problem for us in many parts of Oklahoma. So be aware of this in your landscape or in your neighbor's landscape because that's what has happened here. I have poison, I don't have the poison ivy. The poison ivy is in the sort of the unmanaged uh, wildscape area in the back here. And so that poison ivy has sort of crept over into mine. And so hopefully I, when I control mine, I will be controlling it over there as well. So be vigilant and check your areas for all those undesirable plant species in your ground covers. And while you're doing it, be sure and check for poison ivy coming up in your flower beds, in your shrub beds, and even around some of your, of your landscape trees in your landscape. August tips for lawn and turf. Grassy winter weeds like Poanua, better known as annual bluegrass, can be prevented with a pre-emergence herbicide application in late August. Water in the product after application. Tall fescue should be mowed at three inches during the hot summer and up to three and a half inches if it grows under heavier shade. For areas being converted to tall fescue this fall, begin spraying out Bermuda grass with a product containing glyphosate in early August. Irrigated lawns can be fertilized once again. If you have a problem with spring dead spot in your Bermuda lawn, this should be your last application of fertilizer for the year. Areas of turf with large brown spots should be checked for high numbers of grubs. Mid to late August is the best time to control heavy white grub infestations. Those are your tips for the month of August. And now a little information for September. Our concerts start again in September and our garden fest is September 26th. Please add these to your botanic garden calendar.
For the next two weeks, we will not be seen on the main OETA channel due to August Fest programming. We encourage you to consider supporting OETA during August Fest, and you can catch a couple of our favorite episodes over the next two weeks on OETA's Okla channel. We will be back with a new episode the third week in August with some tips on late summer renovation of mixed planting beds, a behind the scenes tour of the Tulsa Botanic Garden's new construction projects, and a refreshing mango salsa. We'll see you then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society.